Well, uh, thank you, uh, Doug, for your remarks. I must say that um, I felt uh, that uh, the generality, I suppose, of, of, of the remarks uh, were a little bit, uh, perhaps, I don't know, if you just heard our paper, we didn't send you the paper earlier. So maybe that's what explains it. But in any case, general as they are, let me, um, let me respond to all of them. Now, first of all, um, there's a very talk of US hegemony, as I well, another thing I point out in my, uh, in my book, uh, doesn't really get going until the 1970s, very interesting. Uh, just, uh, in fact, the very moment that the idea of US hegemony is born, uh, people are saying that the days of US hegemony are over. Um, and since that time, and of course, um, uh, I, I didn't realize that Doug had, uh, in fact, uh, provided some kind of what Doug seems to imply as a ringing blurb, a ringing uh, uh, endorsement of Leo Banish's new book. But if you have, that's that's good. Certainly, I disagree. From I don't have read the book, but I've read much of what Leo Banish has written in the past, and I uh, don't find I uh, agree with that at all. Uh, but let me let, let me explain to you uh, what what the situation is here. Basically, since that uh, you got, uh, you know basically this idea of declinism in the 1970s, things were not looking good at all for U.S. power. Uh, defeat in Vietnam, a closing of the gold window, uh, all sorts of inflationary problems at home. Uh, by the end of the uh, decade, the dollar uh, was absolutely plummeting, requiring the whole shock. All of these sorts of things were going on, so there was a mood of declinism. By the late 1980s, there were a number of people who emerged. Samuel Huntington was, of course, chief among them, the man, if you would remember, who could not tell the difference between urbanization and genocide. Uh, he was one of the first who said, America is back in power again, you know, etc. But interesting thing is that even, I mean, despite the fact that all the right wing were sort of, you know, uh, masked behind the idea, there were two really interesting things about it. Number one, they could only assert that the US economy had somehow, <coughs> somehow revived itself, renewed its world power, they were called renewables. <coughs> only by further diluting the concept of US hegemony. Because I've already pointed out that concept of US hegemony in comparison to the UK was already diluted. Now they were diluting it further. They were talking about soft power and structural power, and uh, I, I was surprised to hear that even refer to cultural power. Yeah, Coca-Cola is going to, you know, rule the world, right. Um, <coughs> the fact of the matter is that uh, even this discourse actually did not get anywhere until the very peak of the, uh, the 2000s, basically. Uh, it was only when the new economy, which, as I said, Doug wrote a fantastic book about, uh, was really get, you know, was really in its stride. Uh, Alan Greenspan, the so-called great maestro, where did that word go? I suppose we don't remember that once he was, you know, talking about how he made a mistake and, and, and so on. But um, uh, uh, so so and briefly in the closing decades of the millennium, so to speak, of the century. There was an illusion that the US economy had recovered, but in the end, the new economy turned out to be a bubble as well. And what followed was actually a pretty pathetic decade of fairly low growth, despite enormous amounts of financialization, which according to Doug, have restored uh, the health of American capitalism. So basically, you had an equally long discourse, just as, as he's talking about declinism, etc. you had an equally long discourse of people grasping at straws and inventing, basically constantly shifting the goalposts of what uh, uh, what US hegemony is supposed to consist in. I do something very simple in my book. I basically say from the early part of the uh, 20th century, US policymakers themselves set the US dollar's world role as their benchmark for American hegemony. I am judging what is happening to US hegemony on the basis of the benchmark they have set. I did not move any goalposts, they set the goalposts. I'm just measuring their performance according to their own criteria. That's what I'm doing. So that's one very, very important thing. Uh, interestingly, John Connolly, uh, who supposedly said that, uh, what is it, the dollar is uh, uh, our currency and your problem, John Connolly himself said he knew nothing about economics. I think I'll leave that there. Um, he was a lawyer who uh, Nixon brought in to be his treasury secretary. 
Um, the value of the dollar rising in crisis, the value of the dollar rose in the crisis because today there's another chart that we didn't manage to show you, but today the biggest holders of dollars are increasingly US-based uh, private and government institutions. So that increasingly the losers from the continuing devaluation of the dollar are going to be US-based institutions. I'm not saying nobody else will get hurt. But they, the, the chickens are effectively coming home to roost. Um, yeah, the Eurozone looks rocky, and I'm not going to put my bets on, the, uh, on what's going to happen in, in the Eurozone, particularly my argument does not rely on that. I'm pointing to a whole range of things that are happening. Uh, what's really interesting is that if the Eurozone is in such a big crisis, why isn't the dollar even higher? Uh, that's what I would like to know. I don't think that it's a question of a Chinese renminbi internationalizing. I don't care how far it is from internationalizing. Indeed, I don't think that they, are, they would be particularly wise to internationalize it. I, uh, th this is another part of the research I'm doing, and I'm presenting other papers on that. I really don't think that national currencies playing international roles was a good idea. Keynes didn't think so. I think he was right back then. And it is not surprising that people are remembering his ideas about a super sovereign currency, what he called Bangkok today. I think that this, these are ideas which leftists should take. Uh, this is part of, and I think that that ended with a very good question, which I couldn't get to respond to. But this is part of the response to it. Leftists must pay attention to it because working people, and this is where, and I forgot to say this earlier, but this is where certainly I think there's a lot, uh, a lot I have in common, at least with Lee's principal concerns. That is to say that one of the major constituencies who have paid the price of the US's world road have been US working class people precisely because <coughs> Particularly since the 1970s, the maintenance of this world road has required uh, financializations of levels which have basically served to hollow out US industry in the sorts of ways that he is talking about. Uh, and I'm not so sure that, that you can show at all that they have been particularly good for US capital. If they had been that good for US capital, you wouldn't have had the financial crisis that you had. You wouldn't have had all this money that uh, Alan was showing about the purchase of uh, assets. What all this money has done is not restore the profit rate, the sheer quantity of it. The sheer quantity of money chasing returns has actually reduced the profit rate on this. And by the way, um, most people, uh, well, anyway, I, I, I won't, I, I'll leave it at that. I think basically you have got an enormous amount of money chasing fewer and fewer returns. That condition, by the way, has not changed since the crisis. Um, um, so, uh, 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 right, a couple of final points. One, uh, BRICS are not coherent. I don't want to uh, uh, go into great detail about this. He's absolutely right. That is that um, uh, Jim O'Neill uh, originally founded the term. He, in fact, uh, and, and, and um, so, 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 so that, that's neither here nor there. But it is very interesting that Brazil, China, India, uh, uh, Russia, and today also South Africa, each in their own way, I have now picked this up and have started running with it. Not, I mean, in a sense, they are doing it because what, what, one thing that Jim O'Neill was right about and they do share is that they are rather weighty economies in the world. They, and therefore, if they pull their power, then they can show, uh, they can basically take initiatives. And I think that contrary to what most people were expecting, they are taking initiatives where there was no Originally, no coherence, no real connection. They are creating connections precisely because there is at least some minimum common recognition that the neoliberal austerity-based international policy regime does not work for them. And I think this is, this is what is increasingly the mortar that is beginning to bind. For those of you who are interested in this question, I'd be happy to send you a couple of very short columns I wrote on this particular theme. Uh, in, uh, in the, uh, before and, and soon after the, uh, the BRICS summit recently. Why do we talk about decline? Where is all this leading to? I think that can be a very good question, and I think that it deserves respect and an answer. I think that there are two parts to it. Number one, uh, for domestically, both for, uh, well, for working people in Western countries generally, and, and the United States in particular, I think that they, uh, they this is, a, the talk of relative decline has or let, let me put it another way, for the United States, as I pointed out, the efforts to retain the dollar as the world's currency, the efforts to maintain the United States economy, or, or these efforts required that the US government in particular make as few efforts as possible to maintain the productive health of the US economy. This is the main thing from which the US working class have suffered for the last, whatever, 30, 40 years, since the early 1970s in particular. And I think that's one very, very important thing. Internationally, I think these things matter because all these ideas about hegemony, 
globalization, uh, etc. I follow all of these uh, cosmo uh, economic cosmopolitan ideas because they all try to convince us that the world economy is a single, uh, a, a, a seamless world economy over which either only market forces dominate under globalization or only the US dominates under empire. But more, the vast majority of the nation states of the world do not matter. I make the case in my uh, book that actually this is, a, this is a very, very false statement. It gives us very, very wrong ideas for the left as to what is to be done. I think the left has to grapple at, and certainly Doug agreed with me on this here, and I thank him for that because it is possibly the most fundamental point of my book. States matter much more than you think, and, and, and so uh, states have historically played a role in, main, in maintaining economies and also in creating uh, capitalist or ca uh, in, 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 in creating capitalist economies within which workers either have a better or a worse deal. And I think that if you were living today in Guatemala or um, Nigeria or whatever, you would appreciate the difference between a, 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 a capitalist economy with, with some accoutrements of a welfare state and one without. And I think these are all. Uh, <coughs> That's why states really matter a great deal. So internationally, I think that one of the big problems that we have is exactly how are first world struggles to relate to third world struggles. And here I think that if people understood that just as for you, the, for the for US workers, um, some kind of control over the state is very central, so it matters for workers in other parts of the world as well. So I think that is uh, one of the reasons why it matters. Um, yeah, so I, I'm, I'm going to wrap up. So, uh, all right, I'll, I'll wrap up here for, for <coughs> you. I want to try and address um, what Lee Sustan said. And I'll say this for the following reason. I've, I've um, moved to Winnipeg. This was the site of the 1919 general strike, which ended with basically a total defeat. Workers were shot dead, they were away. It's a hop and a skip in prairie terms from the site of the 1936 Minneapolis strike, which was core defining moment in the reconstitution of the US working class. Both were defeated. The leadership of the Minneapolis was jailed, dispersed. We spent two wonderful hours yesterday in the company of one of the few people who has historical memory of that event. And it was very moving. And being in Winnipeg and knowing and being next to people who have that historical me memory is, is chastened. So let's ask the question this way. Not what has the US ruling class done so far to the working class, but what will it have to do to save US capitalism? If it's true that US pockets are full of profit dollars, that there is no problem of long-term decline, that the US still rules the roost, that it's had a few blips, but it can reconstitute itself tomorrow, you know what, they won't have to attack you. Push and they'll fall over. I don't think that's what's coming. I come from the continent that gave the world fascism. I come from the continent where you see on your television screens what is happening in Greece, in Portugal, in Spain, and Italy. I come from Britain, where we've had 30 years uninterrupted assaults on the working class, and it never stopped after Thatcherism. I spend with Radica a lot of time traveling, mainly, in fact, I would say, to talk to these much, uh, you know, this Goldman Sachs myth, Brazil, Russia, India, China. We've been to every single one of them. Okay? It's not a myth. There's something real going on. But I tell you, in terms of the conditions of the working class in those countries, in comparison, you ain't seen nothing. You ain't seen nothing. You can't imagine what a real concerted onslaught on the working class is like. And the question you have to ask is, how much does it take? And that's a real question facing the working class. The Chicago teachers, I think, are phenomenal, because I think that shows two things convince me. The beginning of class is coming back to America. The Occupy movement, which for the first time put the issue back 
of wealth on the agenda. I didn't have to answer a questionnaire and say I'm a liberal or a pinko liberal or a not very liberal. I can say I support Occupy. I am one of the 99%. You could never say that in American discourse before. The second thing is real struggles that are winning victories, reconstituted on the basis exactly of what Minneapolis was about, a struggle leadership. That shows there is hope. That leadership has to know what it's up against. That's why these debates are incredibly serious. So I would just say to Doug, you haven't been engaged up till now. That's true. You don't have the luxury of staying disengaged anymore. It's very easy for us as economic academics, as pundits, just to say, I'm not particularly interested in what this guy is doing. And I'm going to study that. And I'm looking at this interesting interpretation of Marx. No. For people who are going into struggle for the working class, you have to know, and it is your responsibility, to examine the alternative explanations and make sure the working class can judge on the basis of the facts and the evidence which of those is true. That's a historic responsibility. And to, we have to play our part in the reconstitution of a working class movement in America that is capable of responding to what is going to be required of it. Now, I don't know. I am posing a theory. I hope you are right, Doug. I hope the working class of America will not face what the working class of Germany faced in 1933, or what Greece, or what Portugal, or what Spain, or Britain are going through. I hope. But by God, don't write it out. Don't write it off as a possibility. Discuss in relation to the facts. So now, that, that's the first thing. Second, whenever we get to discuss facts, everybody has their own pet set of facts. And, and I just make a simple point. Um, Lee's terrified of being in a... a an audience containing three political economists. I mean, you've no idea how I feel about having a, a, an audience with three Americans. <laughs> um, three, American. three American scholars, I would say. Um, nothing against America as a country, great right? Love your color. So, <laughs> I would just say it in this way. Whenever you bring forward any fact about how fast things grow and how big things got, you always have to take relative to what? Relative to what? So I spent a lot of time doing long-term figures on growth rates of different parts of the world on the world and so on. I tell you, the rate of growth since 1974, you can add up all the GDP of the world. I think discussion with Robert Brenner about this. It, since 1974, it has been half what it was up to in 1974. Simple as that. Secondly, so th there's no comparison. No matter how big it was, it does not compare with what existed before they started the, the, the onslaught that opened in 1970. That's the first thing. Second, um, you know, relative to China, I mean, if you talk about the BRICS as if there's some myth, it's not a myth. The Chinese growth rate is not a myth. Right? The Indian growth rate is not a myth. China is going to overtake America within the next decade in terms of the quantity of GDP. Not GDP per capita. The wages are going up. This spells the end of cheap goods. In the, that is going to have a huge impact on the condition of the working class. Not just their wages are being cut, but their costs are going to start going up because of this process you're describing. Because it's not just the US wages going down, it's the Chinese wages going up. This part of what's got. There's a massive re-equalization of the world going on. And I've done numbers that show it's quite startling since 2000. All the ground that was lost by the third world in the neoliberal eras in terms of inequality has been made up in the last 10 years. That's a phenomenal change. Neil refers to it. It's one of the most phenomenal events in world history. So relative to that, I don't think the US is doing too good. I don't see that. The BRICS are a reality. They're here. They've got many problems. But you cannot just say this is something that the US does not have to worry about it. And they know it. That's why now, you know, why is there a debate about whether to intervene in Syria? It's because they're not sure they can do anything that will bring about a result that is of any benefit to their interest in the region. That's why. Whoever they back, whatever they do, they've lost damn control. That's the real problem. Because they're no longer just number one. There's other people in the world. That's, that's the reality. Now, I just want to say one last thing, um, which is about explanation. See, the problem I have with, I mean, Doug perfectly reproduced very accurately the Leo Panich um, argument. I'm, I'm, I'm sort of grateful to him for reducing it, producing it sort of laboratory pure form. They have two great problems with it. One, how can you have a crisis of success? 
If the American capitalists are doing so well, where did the seven long years come from? It doesn't work for me. It's not rational. If you're doing badly, there has to be a reason for it. And if your profit are wonderful and your pockets are full, something's missing. That's the first thing. The second thing is this. That to me, this argument about um, long-term versus short-term, it's very easy to trivialize other people's arguments. I know I do it all the time. I try to avoid it. You know, hit me, right? You know, in the debate, I'll, I'll say sorry for every time I've done it. You know, okay. Um, I mean that. But you see, the issue is not whether America has been in continuous decline without interruption or blips or anything like that. That's not the issue. It's the scale of the recovery compared with the previous expansion. That's the first thing. And the second thing is this. To me, it's like a patient who comes down with cancer. And they came down with cancer in 1974. And the doctors did chemo, and they did, uh, you know, uh, uh, surgery, and they pronounced the patient cured. And the, the patient walked out and said, hey, the patient's doing great. Then what happens, 2008, there's cancers all over the body. Is that a new cancer, or is it just the old cancer that metastasized? I think it's the second. Um, there was a uh, business week, quote a business week, uh, by somebody I've been trying to find, I think I've read in 1999, I've been trying to find it ever since, when a, a corporate um, figure said, investing in China is different than Japan because they let us participate in their prosperity. You know, we're locked out of Japan, China we can move in. And I think you know, flash, flash, um, flash forward to today, what do we have? We have the pivot to Asia. Uh, a series of military alliances uh, that the U.S. is reviving, uh, a much more subordinate Japan, uh, moving to you know, a Chinese Islamist insurgency in the Philippines, enabling the, the you know, reintroduction of U.S. military there. But at the same time, the economic side of it is the Trans-Pacific Partnership to try to construct uh, an economic sphere of, of U.S. dominance in the Pacific to try to lock out China. And I think that that's what, you know, when Alan says, well, if they're not do you know, why are they squeezing us? If they're doing so well, why are they squeezing us? Well, because we live in a much more competitive world capital system. The U.S. is not the same dominant power when, the world, when Europe was in rubble and Japan was in rubble back in the 50s. I mean, it's, 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 it's a different world now. Therefore, they actually have to compete. And they were confronted with a choice, as I tried to argue. Do we actually stand back and allow ourselves to be just a, a ready economy with cheap consumer goods and a... You know, service, you know, the service economy dominated towards making, you know, hampering the rich. And we come up with, we come up with a different perspective. And they have, they have. They want to reindustrialize. I'm not saying, again, I'm not saying it's going to work. But it's a, it's a general finance anymore. The bubble has burst, and therefore people are going to have to ratchet down their standard of living in order to uh, 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 adjust for that, like it or not. And and, and, and that becomes a competitive advantage versus a, a crisis-bound Europe and a stagnant Japan. I mean, it, and so why not consolidate that? That's where the aggression comes from. I don't, you know, they're going to be plenty aggressive. They'll be, you know, strikers will be shot and so forth. I don't think there's incipient fascism as a result of that. But, you know, even in the context of being relatively successful versus their rivals, they've been able to whittle away something they only tolerated at best for 50, 60 years, the post-war uh, New Deal settlement, which was made on the, on, the, on the back of the CIO and the great labor officers of the 40s and 50s. And the, and, the, and the domesticated labor movement on the basis of steadily rising in, increases of, uh, in standard of living based on uh, for, you know, white workers, at least, uh, and, and male workers, and the expense of surrendering the shop floor and so on. That was all uh, obviously been, uh, that's been, been, been hammered by the last 30 or 40 years. You have a 93% union free private sector. What a wonderful investment opportunity. You want to see the greatest advertisement for that is the economic report of the president, which brags. You know, you're thinking you're reading Doug Henwood. Oh, it brags about how the U.S. has received, uh, succeeded in lowering labor costs. Uh, in terms of the crisis, what did you have for Yes, the, the financial explosion was, was, was bad for the U.S. They're trying to reorient from that. Just because we, we can argue that we're not in permanent crisis since the 1970s doesn't mean there aren't contradictions. Whereas the crisis, capitalist crises can't take other forms rather than a secular decline in the rate of profit. You know, now somebody said once the, the, um, the ultimate reason for all real crises 
uh, always remains the, the poverty and restricted consumption of the masses. Well, you know, that was Marx, and it pretty much describes what happened with, with the bubble burst, right? Not, uh, be another, uh, you know, I'm not trying to open a can of worms about being an under-consumptionist and so forth, but the fact is this crisis was not fundamentally a crisis of, 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 of a falling rate of profit. It was a crisis of new centers of capitalist accumulation creating a crisis of over-accumulation, of, of over-production on a world scale. Not just too many things, not too many cars and autos, but too many auto plants, too many steel plants. I mean, China recently ordered bureaucratically, a couple years ago, ordered the closure of all steel mills built before 2005. Already having, you know, China's excess capacity for steel is bigger than the entire U.S. steel market at this point. Now, guess what? China is still the biggest export market for U.S. steel because there's some high-tech you know, steel uh, and, and, and metallurgy for, for high-tech purposes that they can't do yet. That's, that's based out of the U.S. So you have a, a very, you know, a, it's, a, it's a very complex situation. Now they're adjusting to it. You know, we have this bubble. We have this financial power. Let's use let's use finance and imperial power to to confront to lock in that. Uh, picture now. I think Panish and Ginnan point to point to this expansion. I would disagree with their thesis in that I think that they downplay the tendencies towards international <coughs> competition among the great powers. They see that there's a pure contradiction between the, the advanced countries and everybody else. And I think you know while it's difficult to imagine a U.S.-European war or something like that, it's certainly easy to imagine a, a one that gets U.S. versus China, for that matter, right? And, 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 and you know a, a war breaking out over the over the over the small islands in, in the Pacific or, or North Korea. Uh, 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 blowing up into some kind of mass, massive regional conflict, migration. It's, it's all too real. Imper you know, the, the, the imperial power is there. Uh, and, and, it's, and it's obviously something the U.S. wants to use economically, and we use economic power to shore up in, imperial dominance, even if they have to lick their wounds and, and actually accept a rationing down of, of uh, military spending as a percentage of GDP. Um, uh, which which uh, they're hiding behind a sequester in order to do. The Republicans can say we're not cutting military respect, but that's because it's a pretty strong consensus in the U.S. capitalist class that this thing has gotten, we have too much of the wrong stuff, it's reached irrational levels, we don't have to actually have that, that share of GDP going to the military in order to, you know, when we have far, far dominance uh, far away. Of course, they're not going to rebuild the empire based on drones either. They're going to re re reorient the tool for uh, the next wars over, over a period of time. And in the meantime, if they can actually Use the, the low wage, cheap energy, uh, uh, you know, radically reduced social wage, a competitive advantage. They'll do so. I mean, so they, they have an Obamacare. What's that about? It's about subsidizing capital. With if you call it social safety net, is is too much. It's a social floor. You know, we're not going to have. We don't want to have bubonic play come back. So we have something. You know, we have some element of of a basic provision of healthcare services to try. You know, to try to, to maintain something of an intact. Uh, uh, working class and reproduce it, but it's it's going to be minimal. Immigration debate. What's that about? Why is it? Why is you know? There's been this long-standing tension between the, the Republican right, which uses racism to uh, and anti-immigrant politics to mobilize its base, versus the needs of capitalism, which is for a steady stream of cheap labor. Europe, Western Europe, big demographic crisis. Japan, big demographic uh, crisis. China, big demographic crisis. Right, because of the one-child policy. Not here, as long as you have a flow of immigration, which is why they want to lock that in, uh, you know, reinforce the look downward pressure on wages with, with guest worker programs, right? And with labor kind of haltingly trying to go along with that, trying to pull back from that, the, 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 the change that this doesn't look good. That is a long, that has been a, a, a critical advantage for U.S. capitalism over the last 20-something uh, uh, years, they want to keep it that way. That's why capitalist class wants this there. Republicans want it off the table because it's been an electoral, it's finally proven to be an electoral loser, but they see this as part of their uh, process. Now, to say that the U.S. is doing better doesn't mean they're not going to attack. Again, I'll just conclude on this. They're going to squeeze and squeeze and squeeze until they're stopped. The answer is, you know, I think Sam Gideon wrote an article with a, tr a Canadian uh, a tribune that said, the answer isn't when they're going to stop, it's when, we, when are we going to be strong enough to stop them. I mean, I think that's really what, you know, that sums up the whole the fight against neoliberal agenda. Now, did they violate the spirit, uh, the letter of neoliberalism in 2008, 2009 with the, the stimulus program to, to, to preserve its, its spirit? Did they violate the letter to preserve its spirit? But the agenda uh, continues. And, if in, and what we're, we're living through is a retooling of US capitalism for the next period. Again, it's a generational perspective. And I think we, you know, while, while the long term, the, 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 the debates about decline, and profit rates and so forth. Well, you know, I, I, have, I wade into them regularly. You know, I, I've been following this for years. But it, 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 it actually is, I think, to, can take attention away from the task that I think political economists have today to try to explain this to people. I think, you know, the reprimist consciousness worked, you know, 50 years ago, you know, growing up, things are gradually going to get better, right? 
you know, this sort of reference consciousness that was sort of social, the post-war settlement in, in advanced countries. Well, now reference consciousness works like this. They can't really get away with that, can they? They can't make Michigan into a right-to-work state, can they? They can't, you know, abolish the or social security Medicare, can they? Well, yes, they can. They are. They're going to do it unless until. I don't know where all the time has gone, but let's try and take some questions anyway. And I, what I'd like to do is, as long as it's okay with all the panelists, is, is take actually um, maybe four or five all together. Um, I, I really, really want to be strict and serious about this. I'm not a strict person. But please keep your comments to about 90 seconds. Questions of preferred, but I know that some people need to <coughs> make comments as well, but try and keep it brief. Um, I'll just start. Alan? Sorry. Um, okay, one very specific question to Radhika. Um, talking about the decline of the dollar, this builds on what Dr. Henry said, but you quote the trade, trade weighted index of the dollar. And that's a, a useful statistic in some ways, but it kind of mashes together a lot of things. And uh, I think it would be useful to know against what currencies, actual currencies, is the dollar declining against what actual currencies the dollar appreciating, and what might be the effects of that. The, you know, the, over the what period? The, well, over the period that you're analyzing from the 70s to the present. Because uh, I think it's... You would, uh, need, you, you would need as many graphs as you've got currencies. Yes, uh, I know, but it, all the same, it should be possible to unpack the relationship of the U.S. versus, say, Europe and Japan versus the U.S. against what one might call second-tier capital countries <laughs> versus the relationship okay. to the rest of the world. Second tier. Uh, and I think they, you know, the, the implications of, of movements in the dollar are also different groups and currencies are quite different. And just one other point on the same area. Um, talking about the possibility that the dollar might be replaced as world reserve currency, you made reference to the, uh, since it's not very possible any particular other national currency to take that role on, take on that role in the foreseeable future. You mentioned the SDR, but it seems to me that for the SDR to have any relevance in this context, you, you need a world situation where the IMF or a similar institution actually has authority over the world financial system. And it seems to me that's disappeared in the, in the early 1970s and it's not going to be reconstituted any time soon. So, even if the dollar is on a slow slide, you that you certain other currencies are skeptical about its replacement of the reserve currency. Um, hi, I have a question for the first two presentations. Um, you both uh, relate to the fact how to operationalize financialization. Um, in regards to the first presentation, um, my question would be, I think U.S. financialization is a homegrown phenomenon. If you look at overall debt levels and how much of it is owned by foreigners, the rest of the world owns about 10% of overall U.S. debt, so it's a pretty small fraction of total U.S. debt. And similarly, if you look at assets, the rest of the world owns about 10% of all U.S. financial assets. So I think the U.S. financialization phenomenon is primarily homegrown, not so much in the context of the international dimension. Uh, with regard to the second presentation, I really applaud your uh, attempt to uh, integrate financial assets into the denominator, uh, but then I don't understand how we can discredit financialization so easily because approximately 50% of financial assets in the United States are owned by the financial industry. So if there's a growth in the financial assets that you emphasize, then you have to emphasize uh, or explain the you know, inflation of the this question is for Alan. Uh, at least by implication, it seems you don't like or don't think much of Mandel's periodization of long waves and where they come from. And um, I ask for two reasons. One, because they seem to fit your proper theoretical request. And two, they seem to match your, your political and institutional requests in terms of why this stuff matters. And if you don't buy this particular theory of long waves, do you think we need and or can have an alternative theory of uh, something that goes beyond the business cycle? 
Yeah, um, I come from 33 years in the labor movement, and um, I've most recently been going around speaking about the work of Theodore W. Allen, the invention of the white race. And he makes a rather convincing argument, I think, that in the last three great crises in the U.S. in the 1870s, 1890s, and 1930s, the way the ruling class beat back struggles from below was by appeals to white supremacy. Do any of you discuss white supremacy? Because this topic is on the U.S. working class in your discussion or in your analysis. Does, does white supremacy or white supremacism, do you incorporate that in any way in your analysis? Um, this is a question for Adam. Uh, is there any clarification, really, on how the measure of profit that you just presented, including financial assets in the denominator, relates to the theory of exploitation? Because it seems to me, correct me if I'm wrong, but it seems to me that if you remain committed to the idea that the rate of profit is governed by S over C plus B, then you're going to end up double counting financial assets in the sense that if company one <laughs> buys assets in company two, then you know, that then it may be reinvested by Read my article. <laughs> but yeah. Before you guys respond, I, I would, I'd also like to add that it, it does seem like if you were to do that, kind of agree, kind of agree, that you would want, you'd need to have some way to systematically disaggregate um, money capital from financial capital that is essentially claims on um, on future profits of the, part of the, the, the product of, of, of other firms. I mean, there, there, seems, there, there must be some way that you, have, you can systematically disaggregate the two for, to, to properly account. And then also the problem of I mean, trade, the problem of uh, being separate maybe removing the financial sector. Um, I feel like there's not going to be another round of questions. Maybe one more person who's really desperate to talk or should we? Yeah, just very quickly. Okay. Um, I'm Jeff Lowe. I'm a senior fellow at the Center for Global Policy at the University of Lee Sustar, um, about the possibilities of reindustrialization. They talked a lot about it in the 1980s when the first, you know, this wave of hollowing out of the uh, American populations. There was nothing happened then. They, they, they couldn't get it together. I, in your own city of Chicago, I was there a while ago. Uh, you see the relics of the industrial economy still standing in you know, the factories. They blew up the, the housing projects, and now they're going to shut down the schools in the black community. Where is this? You know, aside from you know, where is it actually? You know, this reindustrialization more than an idea, and how how probable or how likely is the U.S. ruling class to make this make this a reality? Maybe you guys can just respond from there, and just just for the sake of sure. time. So. Okay. Uh, yeah. Um, okay. So uh, first of all, um, Alan's questions. Um, uh, the, I, I use the trade million dollars index simply as a summary. I mean, I'm, I'm not at the moment investigating which part of the world the dollar is rising, or for which other currency the dollar was rising and falling against. But on the, on, I did have one comment which I didn't get the chance to make earlier on Doug's identification of tier two currencies. Uh, I think that again, this is one of those moving the goalposts phenomenon. I think that, in fact, I very clearly remember somewhere in my book there is this point where. You know, uh, just when, uh, for, I mean, you know, you, you see a progression throughout, you know, at one point, you know, U.S. is supreme, we have all the world's gold, we have, we have this, that, and the other. Then U.S. investment position declines and they produce some new rules and some, something further goes wrong, then another rules is produced. So at one point, the rules becomes, well, actually, we may be highly indebted, but our debt is easier service than that of a third world country. Well, by the time it becomes necessary to compare the U.S. to a third world country, you've already lost the battle. So I, that's what I want to say about that. Number two, um, I personally am not, uh, uh, to, I'm not necessarily advocating the use of the SVR as a, as a replacement reserve or even as a, although I have another paper in which I talk about the conditions under which this might take place and what would not be right with it. Because first of all, at least so far, although this could change, I mean, particularly as the US weight in the world economy goes down, despite all the machinations of uh, the folks who compare, uh, compile US national account statistics. I don't know if you read the accounts recently. I mean, once again, they have come up with a new method of boosting US uh, uh, income. And no matter what you say about how wonderful those methods may be intrinsically, so long as the rest of the world economy does not employ those methods, US uh, GNP is being exaggerated. So the decline that we are talking about from 
one half to, to, to a quarter uh, over, uh, in the, in, up to 1973, and then it's remaining uh, stable. I think this may be questioned if you take that into consideration. But my point really, because the SDR still remains in the US's control because that's what the voting structure of the IMF is. So practically all proposals that talk about the use of the SDR actually require a major reform of the international financial institutions, including the IMF. Uh, certainly that goes for the Chinese uh, uh, proposals. Um, whether this will happen or not, I don't know. If So long as the United States has the power to scuttle those proposals, it will probably exercise them. My emphasis is on all the arrangements that are being made to sidestep the dollar, which are affecting the dollar in terms of its value. So that's that, that's my response to them. Um, I uh, uh, Your point about the... Um, uh, uh, financialization being a U.S. homegrown affair, I, I think what you are referring to, the statistics you are referring to are statistics of the post-crisis era, like of today, but in fact they were much different. What you are looking at is a massive decline in foreign holding of U.S. assets. The long-term trend of U.S. Uh, of, foreign ass of foreign assets in the United States has reached about 10%. It was 2-3% in 45, so it is like a small segment. Yeah, but, but the, well, you have to also look at what happened in between 45 and 2013. Okay, anyway, I mean, the, the, my main point is that U.S. dollar liquidity requires U.S. dollar denominated financialization. So in fact, I'm not necessarily disagreeing with you. I'm precisely pointing out that everybody talks as though financialization is something that affects, has affected all economies more or less uniformly. No, there have been two economies in particular that have been at the center of financialization. They are the US and the UK. The UK has performed a particular, as I say, aiding role, facilitating role in all of this. Uh, so in, in that sense, you're, it, we are agreeing ab about this um, on the whole. Um, so um, I've written down something else, uh, inflation of US something. Uh, I think it wasn't uh, your question that I, I wrote down, but I can't. the financial sector owning uh, financial assets. That was for other, yeah, yeah okay. Um, I think the other questions are all for me, so we don't have. So, Mandel. Yeah. Mm. I remember <laughs> once meeting my Ernest completely by accident on a train in Belgium, and I was in the middle of explaining some battle that was in the nation of Charles Gisbert, and I said, <laughs> my enemies think, and then he looked at me and he said, you have <laughs> I mean, I'm the only person I know who is proposing this theory of the rate of profit. Not even my friends support this theory of the rate of profit. So I'm not going to sit here and defend, you know, like all the details. I have written a paper in which I try to explore this in a very systematic way, including the issue of, um, including the issue of double counting, to which it was a real breakthrough. I thought about this for five years, and I suddenly, I came to the conclusion there is no issue of double counting in relation to debt. Because every debt instrument that is created, if it is used as means of circulation, is a new monetary instrument. And what you've had, I mean the Keynesians understand this now, is a massive inflation of debt instruments functioning as money. That's what's really going on. And there is no double counting. You have to count all of them, because all of them constitute claims on capital. The specific thing that's happened in this period is that they have entered the market for capital. You see, in Marx's day, what basically happened, I mean, there was some, some, you know, he speaks about fictitious capital. I draw on his writings on it extensively. I read all the chapters that nobody else, everybody else stops at when they get to the fifth session of their capital volume three reading group, you know, and, and, and I deal with that. Um, including the statement, very interesting, he makes when he discusses commercial profit where he says, we now turn to the finished form of the rate of profit. What we have said up until now, dealing just with industrial capital, is not the full form. So the full form includes commercial capital, financial capital, rental capital, fictitious capital. So I dealt with all of that. But I think mainly in his day, that when the, when the, when the merry-go-round stopped and capitalists stopped investing, they just stopped up, you know, essentially sort of gold, currencies, not something that was competing with investment, with, with, with productive investment. Now I think that what financialization really represents is a stage in which all these instruments have been derivativized and turned into instruments of which you can invest in. I mean, investors can keep this number. It's not investment at all. It's buying somebody's debt, you know, one of the great ideological 
infusions of Israel. So what's happening is therefore they are entering into the great profit, the formation of that. They're directly dragging down as competitors with competitive investment. But that's what I think is going on. This is in the paper, and the reason I'm inviting people to take part in the debate is I think, especially since I'm the only one who agrees with my own theory, but, you know, it would be kind of good to hear your ideas and sort of clarify this, because I think it's theoretically incredibly important issue. Now, Mandel, yeah, I mean, look, I work with Mandel on Marx, Ricardo, Straffer. We, um, for a long time, I did basically accept some form of empirical Validity. I also, you have to remember my father, Christopher Freeman, was basically the, the neo Schumpeterian king. I mean, he was the guy who rescued Kondratiev and Schumpeter, right? And then my stepmother, Carlotta, has just written this book on financial bubbles and technology. I'm immersed completely in long way debates. Here's my theory. And there are many articles I've written which are scattered around obscure journals, mainly third world journals, where I put this out. I, I make a distinction between endogenous and exogenous processes. Okay. I think capitalism has an endogenous process of decline, but it only recovers through an exogenous intervention. It doesn't self-restore. And the fundamental problem with Schumpeter's theory, and I think Mandel is just ambiguous about this, I'm going to go back and revisit it, because I have to write a, a review of Stutz's um, uh, biography of Marx, is I think that this notion of self-restoration creeps in. Schumpeter was extremely clever greatly underestimated Austrian economists in terms of the way he put this. To him, equal, he was the only Austrian who said equilibrium is not a reality except insofar as the economy moves around it. Because he wanted to restore the notion of self-restoration to an economy in the recession which was completely out of whack. Now, the, when I went and looked at it in 2000 earlier, I just produced a little paper. One of the paper, how much is enough? Looking at how the US got out of the last, last crisis. It got out of it in the war. And it got out by GDP went up to 48%. State investment, state sorry, state spending went up to 48% of GDP. In private investment collapsed to 3%. That's a complete supplanting of the normal accumulation mechanism of capitalism. They can only get away with that under two circumstances. One is, you know, war, when they can rat, they can basically buy the peace of the working class through precisely sort of white supremacy, but also imperial supremacy. Um, but secondly, the other circumstance is development, when it's necessary to defend the people by cementing some sort of protectionism. <coughs> you know, Radica writes about this a lot, combined development, using combined development to, 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 to develop the economy. Under those circumstances, the working class is actually able to impose, which is what the dialectic of permanent revolution is about, its own solution, as opposed to the, the war solution or, or the fascist solution. So, so, I think we have a choice, precisely because it's not automatic. We are now in a period where Marx's fundamental doctrine this is about the laws of motion are about emancipation. We have to choose what to do, which is why I'm so insistent on this matter of the formation of the consciousness of the working class. And one last thing on, on, on uh, supremacy and so on. I don't forget to say that the, the significance of the 1919 general strike in Winnipeg is that was the birthplace of the Communist Party of Canada, and that was the birthplace of the NDP. And what, you, what, the, what this represents is the permanent consciousness of the working class. When the working class forms political organisations, they become the vehicle through which it learns and absorbs lessons such as you have to fight the white supremacists, all workers have to unite, you have to fight for all people against whom discrimination operates, whether it's women, gay, whatever, because you have to create a popular bloc large enough to establish the dictatorship. This is very basic Marx. But, but political parties, consciousness, bodies through which consciousness of the working class comes to mature and is developed, are essential. And, and, and that's what's missing. That's what's missing. It's a great puzzle as to how and whether that will be constituted in the advanced countries of the world, in the rich countries, where political parties will open. Political debate will open. It's the absence of political debate in the USA, um, particularly, that concerns me the most, and it seems to me that's what people have to deal with. Yeah. But therefore, a climate debate and discussion, which the working class can get access to, which is what our book series is all about, which is why we come down at 4 o'clock. I get ready to sign a copy of the book. Can I pay for it? We ain't yet in socialist communism, but I tell you, four of those will get you one half of a half of our text.
Hello, thank, thanks for uh, coming up. The questions are to me about racism and white supremacy are related. Um, my article goes through a lot about the racial impact of the crisis. The attack on public sector workers is thinly disguised racial attack. I mean, when Mort Zuckerman, a billionaire, says, you know, public sector workers and new ruling class, who's he talking about? African American lunch ladies in public schools with a pension? I mean, that's, that's, what, that's who's absorbed women and, and African Americans have absorbed the biggest uh, hit for the attack on public sector workers. But the reindustrialization, it's, it's heavily a southern phenomenon. That's when it's a low wage, not a uh, union free area. That's why not only Boeing built a plant, not even plant in South Carolina, Airbus has moved in to uh, Alabama to build a, uh, a production line. And you have a whole series of, 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 of Korean, Japanese, and uh, other companies who have moved in into the South. Why? Because of the legacy of white supremacy and racism, lower wages, uh, lack of unionization. The two, the two go hand in hand. Now, can it work? I mean, you know, you're going to have side by side the, the, the obliterated towns like Detroit and Gary, Indiana, where there's no investment, and the cities are basically left to starve and put under Greek-style financial dictatorship by appointed uh, officials by the governor, which is basically what's happening. Because you know, neoliberalism versus democracy. You'll also have areas in which you know you have basically neo-company towns. You know, where in, 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 in you know in Smyrna, Tennessee, or the Nissan plant, or or some of these small towns now in Canton, Mississippi. I mean, that, that's where, really where, where a lot of this is going to, uh, the challenges for labor is going to come about. I, I find that, you know, I'm optimistic. I think, you know, in terms of the May Day marches of immigrants back in 2006, 2007, who would have thought that the revival of May Day as a labor uh, a focal point would come from the ranks of immigrant workers? But it did, with hundreds of thousands of workers, you know, millions across the country. And, and uh, the Chicago Teachers Union, by having sending 20,000, 30,000 members downtown the first day of the strike uh, uh, with, with so popular that the police didn't bother direct traffic, basically paralyzing all of downtown, gave a sense of that, but with some more, some more economic power. Occupy, uh, a demonstration for which no leaflet was ever produced, brought you know, tens of thousands, maybe 100,000 people on the streets in New York City in, in November. I mean, it's, it's there. You know, Wisconsin, the, the Occupy gets there. It's not yet organized. And the forces of organized labor and the left are still far too weak. And I think that that's... You know, we can see the, the potential. We don't have to speculate the way we might have a few years ago about where are conscious of workers and so on. That's our job. And I think the, the task of the conference is try to connect the, the theoretical tools and traditions we have to this emerging group. We're going to lose this room pretty quickly. Uh, do you want to say something? No, no.